Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn here with a build guide for the Lee & Lee 011 Vision, where I'm going to transform it into this view that you can see here, and I'll show you more of that at the end. But in this guide, which is going to be in-depth, I'm going to show you all the steps for creating that build process, as well as the things to bear in mind about the case in terms of airflow and setup, and also the little highlights on the things that you can do to make your build easier. So some tips and tricks to watch out for when going about the build process, things that I discovered while doing it that will save you some time and make your life a little bit easier. Obviously this is a very nice case with a lot of glass so you can see into it quite well, but the options for installing your parts in there are a bit more limited than other Lee and Lee cases. So it's worth thinking about planning out your build before you get into it, because although you can fit a 360 mil radiator in here on the side panel, you're limited in terms of the option because obviously the top panel is now glass. So airflow, you do need to think about that. So I'm going to show you what I ended up with, which is six intake fans and then two exhaust on a 240 mil NZXT radiator. So stick with me for that and all the specs of the build will be in the description so you can find out more about it. I'm going to start with the process of taking it apart, stripping it down to show you what's possible in here. There's a lot of plastic peel that needs to come off both sides of every glass panel, as well as some protective covers that are in place during the shipping process to stop any damage there on the edges too. Most of the panels will come away with relative ease and are held in place with thumb screws. You can see that this panel here, for example, takes off really easily. And then there's a little magnet in the corner there to hold it in place. Obviously we don't have a protective bar running down the front as you do on other Lee & Lee cases. So now they've just got this little notch in the corner. You will notice there is a white sticker on that corner though to hide it away so it's not seen once the build is finished, which is pretty nice. The case has a nice large removable dust tray at the bottom and you will spy that there was something stuck in it there and that's because in transit, my accessories case came open inside the case and spilled things inside it. Hopefully you won't have the same problem. But the process of taking things off is really straightforward. You'll see again that the top panel also has a couple of thumb screws and then it just slides out and you can easily access that. Now you can also take off the front glass panel, but the instruction manual notes that you don't need to. However, I'm going to show you how because it might make life a little bit easier for your build process and it just gives a better view inside the case. So you need to remove a lot of screws there. You'll see there's a front screw at the bottom and another screw there. And then you need to take off the back panel and there's three screws to remove down the side here as well. So there's a lot of screws here and they're tiny, so they could be easily be lost. You then need to pull off the power button strip at the front so you can access some more screws that are then there. But you can see how much you can take this case apart and how flexible it is in terms of, sort of dismantling it. And this actually becomes was quite useful later on. More screws on that front glass and then it just pops up and out and it's now out of the way. As I said, you don't need to do that, but it's nice that you can. And that sort of flexibility goes into a lot of the other parts. So back here, you can see the accessories box, which should have been cable tied to that SSD tray, but had fallen out, opened up and spilt things everywhere. So I had to tidy that up first of all. And then you'll see that we have the hooks with the various front panel connectors. And I'll show you where to connect those in later on. And then a fairly nice dual chamber setup with plenty of space for cables, as you'll see by the end. One of the interesting highlights of this case as well is that there is a bit at the back for the power supply unit, which you can also remove, although you don't have to. Again, you can slide your PSU into that, for example, and then just screw it in. But I found this was useful to be able to take out. And this is actually one of the highlights of the case because it means that the power power supply sticks out a bit outside the case, which means you then have more room inside, which means if you have a larger power supply, it's going to take up less room and be less of a problem, but also good for cable management. Up here, you'll see the SSD hard disk drive cages and take the thumb screws out and then loosen these screws here and you can remove those as well. This then allows you to either take them out and get rid of them entirely if you don't plan on using them or to then be able to fit your drives in there and then just put them back in again in a minute. Here is a thumb screw which you pull down and then you can yoink out the fan tray slash radiator tray. I initially thought you were meant to undo that thumb screw. You're not. It's literally just tug on it 
it then releases a catch that then lets you pull it out. The interesting thing about this tray is it can be flipped around so you can have it whichever way round you want. And Lee and Lee notes that you can do a push-pull setup in here, which is fairly standard with Lee and Lee cases in my experience. So you can choose which way round to put it and mount a 360 mil radiator there. You'll see that you can then remove the SSD tray and the motherboard tray. So at the bottom rear is a little bracket that you can see loads of thumb screws, take those out, more thumb screws at the rear of the motherboard and on the tray itself, remove those and then you can just take the entire motherboard tray out. Now this is really handy for the build process because you can end up doing this, which means that you can basically install your motherboard and your cooler or fans on the tray outside the case which makes life a lot easier for the process of building and more straightforward for accessing these things and getting it sorted out really easily this is actually fantastic i'm going to show you a couple of different ways to do it so that you've got that in your mind but i wanted to show you the process of how you can do that and how interesting it is now the fan tray at the bottom is removable with a couple of screws down the bottom there and then you can tug that out and then obviously you can take that dust tray out as well for the build you can see now we've got the case stripped down considerably from what it was originally all the glass is gone multiple panels the motherboard tray the ssd tray the power supply bracketing the hard disk drive cages all of that's removed you can see how spacious it is and that process is really straightforward too also note nice tall feet there for cooling purposes this is the accessories box as i've shown you already and you'll notice inside the manual of a hardware list of all the different screws that are included unfortunately you do need to sort this out yourself so even if yours hasn't spilled out everywhere as mine did you will need to run through all these different screws and put them in in a logical way so this little box is actually really nice as it's segmented so you can then work out what screws go where and then put them into different spots in that box for storage purposes you can see the list of accessories and screws that you need so it's just sort of putting them in into relevant piles and then sorting it out one thing that i'll note as i'll show you in a second is the hard disk drive and ssd screws ever so slightly different and it's hard to spot initially so i actually ended up grouping those together by mistake but you'll see that the little spots in it for putting these screws in and this is great for storage purposes because it just makes life a lot neater and easier if you need to return to those later one other thing that i don't show in this but it also includes a anti-sag bracket for your gpu as well which is really handy so there's loads of accessories in there now i want to start by showing you the ssd mounting process because the setup for this is interesting and straightforward but as i said you'll see there's ever so slightly difference here between the ssds and the hard disk drive screws it's really hard to see but the ssd ones have a thinner thread on them so worth noting there's a slight difference between those and you won't be able to use the other ones on the ssds but you need these little washers that you put onto your ssds and then you just screw those screws on the top of those and essentially that acts as a little bracketing system that then lets you install them in the case there are two different ways to install ssds in the case whether using the cage or the door at the back so note that before you go forward with this but this is how i'm doing it initially so you can see this crucial drive is now ready to go you open up the door at the rear here and then you're just basically sliding it into that tray so there's larger holes that then go down into a smaller one and what you need to do is just notch that in don't screw the screws in too far which is a mistake that i made because then you can't push it all the way over so what you need to do is loosen them slightly push it into the door and then screw them down and tighten them so it's secured into place now you can put up to three ssds on this door if you want to but i also found it useful for a fan controller which I'll show you later on. So that could be multi-use this panel, but you do have the option to install multiple drives on there. So you can see another crucial drive, for example, we can pop that at the top and then you can easily put your cables in there later on and then hide them away behind there. So it's nice and neat and it's easy to do. And because that door's removable, you could take that off, install these and then put the door back on if you wanted to. You do have to think about the positioning of where things are gonna be and where the cable is gonna run though. The other option is to install it in the cages. So there's two cages included in the case that you saw me remove earlier and you can then mount your SSDs into here. Now this uses different screws. These are the same ones you'd use for the motherboard, which has a small 
round top to it and then a smaller top on top but it's basically quite a bit different so watch out for that they're motherboard screws essentially you're mounting the drive into here now this is a bay that would also work with a traditional hard drive as well as an alternative option so if you wanted to put full-on drives in there you could do that and then it just slides back in and then obviously re-screw those screws and put the thumb screws back in that it took out earlier on now you don't have to do this you could just get rid of those and then make it easier for building in because you'll have more room for your cabling so that might be preferable so it's nice to have that flexibility but this has the same logic as the ssd mounting in the the slide in and then need to be tightened up so it's secured into place now for the fans in this system i'm using leon lee's al120 v2 fans and i'm going to set them up on the radiator bracket that i removed earlier on now you will notice that i actually probably put these on the wrong way around so that's something to bear in mind and you need to think about where your cable is going to run as well because obviously that's going to be an eyesore if you put it in the wrong place, top or bottom, for example, in here. But I've screwed these in so that they'll be facing towards the rear of the case with the back facing inwards, which means that it's then going to be an intake set up so that they're pulling air through into the case. You can see that you can pop it back in like this. Now, alternatively, you could mount a radiator on the case in there and set it up that way. That might well be preferable with a 360mm radiator if you have a high-end CPU. And I would recommend using intake in that setup as well because that will then ensure that your CPU gets good cooling. You see you have the option to flip it whichever way around you want though. And I probably should have put it this way and then the fans on the other side because it would have been neater. Because the way I've got it set up is basically the way that the radiator should mount on it. But you can see that this wouldn't look right with those bars across the fans. So you need to think about that beforehand. Now for the bottom tray, again, face down with the fans. Because what I want to do is intake from the bottom so cold air gets blown onto the graphics card and onto the motherboard. So we're positioning those down here. You could use 140 mil fans, but again, I'm using 120 here. So you can see there's some gaps there, which is something worth thinking about. Maybe 140 mil fans would be a better option, would fill up the space a bit nicer. So we're then screwing those in from the underside. Again, thinking about where the cable's going to go. So I actually flipped the fans over because initially I had the cables facing in the wrong direction, perhaps. You'll see in a second where you're going to put the cabling and think about what that's going to look like at the end. Nice thing about this, obviously, is that you're mounting these fans outside the case. You can put the tray in, but you can also take it out if you want to when you're putting the motherboard in, which you will see makes life simpler. Now you can see where my fan cables ended up. I've got it on the right-hand side because there's access to more holes on the right, which gives you more options for where to run it. So initially I thought maybe I should run it down the bottom here into this gap, but you could also run it through the rubber grommeting on the other side. So you have options or by the fans themselves on the side panel there. So there's a few different places that you can do it. It's really a personal preference. I could have put it the other way around. For this build, I'm using the MSI Z790 Gaming Pro Wi-Fi motherboard and I've done a review separately on this that I'll link to in the description so you can find out more about it. But a nicely affordable board with plenty of USB ports and other highlights, including Wi-Fi 6E. And a nice little setup here with a good contrast between the black and white. I'm also using a Crucial P3 Plus alongside those Crucial SSDs. This is a Gen 4 NVMe SSD which has decent speeds and is reasonably affordable too. On this board, it just clips into place. You can see there's a little latch that basically puts that in there. Now, I've done a guide separately on not removing stickers and also being sure to use these heat shields when you're using a drive like that to make sure it runs at the right speed. And then I'm also using Corsair's Dominator Titanium RAM. This is the first edition of their DDR5 RAM that runs over 7,000 mega transfers a second. And it has the ability to be customized because you can not only 3D print your own parts, but you can also use either RGB lighting or these heat sinks on there, which give better cooling for the RAM as well, because it's obviously very fast RAM. And then you can make it cooler, both in looks and in capabilities. So, uh, nice little addition to the case and again contrast with the black motherboard and more importantly making the most of the 14th gen cpu and xmp that i'm going to be using here i'm using intel core i5 14600k so relatively affordable cpu 
which is obviously upgradable in future on this board. And this is the process for installing it, as you can see, just very carefully seating it down over the pins and then notching things down. You'll notice that we need to install the RAM in A2 and B2 as marked there, the two slots, so the second one in from the left and then the fourth slot if you're using two sticks of RAM as I am, which to be honest is probably the best move for DDR5 RAM anyway. It's a bit more stable with two sticks in my experience, especially with XMP. I'm using a Kraken 240 RGB from NZXT for this build. I've done a wiring guide and setup guide for this separately that I'll link to in the description. But here I'm obviously going to be swapping out the fans that come as standard with this cooler for Lian Lee's AL120 fans, which is something you can do. That's not a problem. This is a nice cooler and it has a display on it, which will show both your CPU and GPU temperatures, as well as other things like GIFs, clock displays and more. And the setup here is easy to do. You can install this standoff backplate on the rear of the motherboard with relative ease, just got to push these things out to the four corners. Now you'll note that I'm doing it on the motherboard before I put it on the motherboard tray. But obviously, as you've seen, because the motherboard trays are removable, you could do this once the motherboard's installed on that tray and still have access to be able to do that. And that's one of the nice highlights of this case. Once we've got the back plate seated there, you'll see that the little holes are available to put the standoffs in. So you just need to screw those four things into the corners. Again, as I said, I've done a detailed wiring and setup guide on this cool I'll link to if you need to find out more about it. But for this CPU being an i5, it's actually delivering enough cooling capabilities with 220 mil fans on the rear. With the motherboard prepared, obviously you can put it onto the motherboard tray. You could do that while it's in the case, or as I've shown, you can take the motherboard tray out and you can do it in this way. It makes it easier, it's easy to access, it's easier to see, and you can also install the all-in-one cooler like this as well, which I'll show you in a second, or well, there's something to bear in mind there. So we obviously use the same screws that I showed you for the SSDs and the cages, the very small screws into the multiple parts of the motherboard. Should be about nine screws in total to screw in there. This is an ATX motherboard, so you can see it fills up the tray quite nicely, a good size to it, but you do have other options in what you can use. And then you can either install the tray back in or finish fixing it up as in installing things. Now you do have two different options in terms of the installation. If you want to copy what I'm doing, then you'll need to make sure you mount it in the bottom positions because two different positions you can put this motherboard tray in. This is the high position and the low position. As standard, it's in the high position. So I'm just gonna show you that now. So you put it in like this and then you have to put this extra bracket at the back and screw that in with a thumb screw. A little bit fiddly to get in and out that bracket, spare that in mind, a bit of a hassle there. But you can see this is the setup with it in the standard position. Now, if you do this, you can only fit one 120 mil fan at the rear for exhaust purposes. You'd probably do this if you are either got a 360 mil all-in-one cooler on the side mounted where I've got my fans, or if you're using a CPU air tower cooler instead, and then you'd have an exhaust fan at the rear here. And that's one thing you can do, but alternatively, if you want to copy what I'm doing, you need to put the motherboard into the low position. I will note this actually makes things a little bit trickier in terms of how you set up the wiring, and I'll show you that in a second. But you can see if you remove that bracket, then you drop the motherboard down into the lower position, re-screw in the thumb screws and the different holes there, and then secure it. You then put the bracket that was on the bottom at the top instead. Doing this then means that you can put up to two 120 mil fans on the rear. So again, this is another alternative. If you're using an air tower cooler, you could have exhaust or intake fans at the rear here, depending on how you're setting that up. And then you could run those out as well. So I want to show you the different options of what's possible in case you're trying something else or just want to know how to do it. That's how you do that. So you can install two fans there. And this is the same position that you need to use if you're going to be installing a 240 mil radiator as I am. 
So you can see the difference in this setup and how low the motherboard sits. You'll also notice that moving it down then exposes a couple of holes. There are some rubber washers that you can get or grommets that will fit over those holes. So you can tidy them up a little bit. You then obviously need to run your power cables and other things from the top of the motherboard up through the holes at the top, which I'll show you in a second. But these obviously fill in those gaps that are otherwise there behind the motherboard when it's in the high position. So that's what it looks like when you filled in those holes. So I've shown you a couple of different options of what you can do and whether you're going to mount it in this is obviously going to depend on what you're planning to do with your build. So for example, if you are planning on having a 360 mil radiator on the side, then maybe two exhaust fans at the rear would be a nice addition to make sure you've got a good airflow there. Now, if you want a 240 mil radiator, you do need to keep in mind that on the motherboard tray, you need to take off the top PCIe bracket there, unscrew it and remove it entirely from that and then flip it around and slide it back in and screw it back in in the same place. This is because otherwise you can't fit the radiator in there. It's fairly simple to do. A little bit fiddly because you do need to screw in the far end that you're slotting in as well as the end we've already unscrewed. So it's a little bit tricky to do. But when you've done that, that then ensures there's enough space for the rad. If you don't do this, you won't be able to fit the radiator in, which I found out the hard way and was perplexed by momentarily. But this is how you'd set that up. The good news is that doesn't interfere with the graphics card slot when it's in the lower position. So as long as the motherboard's in the low position, you won't have a problem. Now, as I've said, I am swapping out the standard fans included with the NZXT radiator for the AL120 V2 fans. That's because I want them to match the rest of the case. And this is really easy to do with this cooler as well. It's one of the reasons I like NZXT coolers because they have a cable that comes out of the pump that allows you to control fan speed. We can then use the sync cable from the AL120 fans plug it into the controller, which I'll show you in a little while. So then you can ensure the RGB lighting still matches up with everything else when you're using L-Connect, which is Lee and Lee's software for controlling the lighting. So now you can see you can mount the radiator at the back. Make sure you put the tubes at the bottom if you're going to set it up like this. Then that will ensure that the pump will work well. And if over time any bubbles form in it, air bubbles, they will travel to the top of the radiator and will sit there. But you can see we can now secure all those screws in. Now, if you're doing this while it's just on the motherboard tray rather than outside the case, then you wouldn't secure the top screws because there'd be nowhere to do it at that moment. So you'd have to do that at the end. But you do have the flexibility to be able to do that. Or you can secure it while it's in the case as I'm doing now. You would use the tiny screws that come with the radiator to secure it down there. And then you have this final view of what that looks like obviously you have to run the fan cables out to the side as well so pay attention to which way around you've done that when installing the pump head you have some options in where to put the tubes and this means you can either run them on the right hand side for example or maybe on the top or on the bottom the advantage of this cooler is that the display is actually rotatable within NZXT's CAM software. So it is working out which way around fits best for you. I was trying to think about whether it was going to interfere with the graphics card or not by having them on the side. So just working out the logic of that. Now this all-in-one cooler does come with its own pre-applied thermal paste, but I've already used this in a recent build, so I'm now using Thermal Grizzly in place of that, and then spreading that across the IHS of the CPU with a little spatula to make sure there's good coverage there and good cooling. This is Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut paste, which is nice and efficient for cooling purposes. We can then put the pump head down on the top and seat that down, as I said, tubes on the right hand side and then you just have to secure it over those standoffs and put the thumb screws down on top of that with one on each corner. Take care to ensure that these are secured nice and tightly and each of them is secured down well because if you do find that these are loose that may mean that there's not good contact between the copper plate and the CPU which will then result in hotter CPU temperatures and potentially thermal throttling. Should have done a video on separately. This is easy enough to do, but you can do it with your hand to start with and then use a screwdriver to finally secure them down. Just be careful not to over tighten them. Don't be too aggressive with it because you can potentially damage the motherboard 
and the pins on that. We can then peel off the stickers. You can see where the tubes are seated in this position and they do look like they're going to go down, possibly sitting on top of the graphics card, but in the end it's not too bad. You have the ability to maneuver the motherboard tray out. Obviously I've just put it in, so taking it back out again might not make sense, but I wanna show you why this can be useful because obviously we've got a lot of cables to plug in from the case in terms of things like the USB connections, front panel connections, HD audio and more. So something to bear in mind, it actually does make life a little bit easier if you have the ability to take this motherboard tray out. But this is the final product as we've set it up, which is basically ready to go and just needs the wiring connected up. You could do this before you even set it into the case. You just set it all up on the motherboard tray by taking it out of the case in the first place. This is one of the biggest highlights of this case and the flexibility of it in terms of just doing the build process. As you can see, you can access multiple angles with ease and minimal fuss here. The other advantage is it just means that you can access things a bit more easily down the bottom because in that bottom position, as you'll see in a second, accessing the cables at the bottom is a little bit fiddly and problematic. So something to keep in mind when we're going through there. Next stage of this is installing the power supply unit. So I'm using a Corsair RM850X for this install. I've done a wiring guide on this that I'll link to in the description. This is a 850 watt power supply unit modular. So obviously we only need to plug in the cables that we're going to be using. And I'm going to show you where to connect those up. But the interesting highlight of this build is the way the shroud works. So you can install the power supply directly in the case with this still in place or you can take it out use your four hexagonal top screws to secure it to this bracket and then put the bracket back in this bracket means that the power supply sticks out a little bit from the rear of the case which then gives you more room inside so this is ideal if you've got a larger power supply but also with one that's about this size it means that the cabling is easier to maneuver around and also to get into the cable tidying areas you can see just how that sits in there. there's actually plenty of of room to adjust things and even to access the cables once it's installed as well you do need to secure it with those various screws but it's not necessary to take that bracket out i just want to note that because you could just slide the power supply in and then secure it in the normal way now you can see i've already plugged in all the cables i'm going to need two eight pin cpu power connectors and the 24 pin and more and then just put the power supply in now quickly revisiting earlier on in the build because i want to show you the various case cables that you need to connect hd audio front panel usb c and usb a i want to show you where to plug those all in to make sure that all your connections are going to work well but as I noted, in the low position, these are actually quite fiddly to access. So first of all, run them through the gaps at the bottom and then think about the positioning of your motherboard. So if you haven't already, like I have, take it out because it's much easier to plug the cables in than to put the motherboard back in where it is so make life a lot more straightforward and less hassle so go through these connections first of all we're going to start with the hd audio which in this case is j audio one the bottom left of the motherboard that's the 3.5 mil then we have the front panel connection which is on the far right hand side this is usually the same on most motherboards in this case it's jfp1 but it'll also be marked things like f panel as your front panel connections then we have the USB-A, so that's the two USB ports on the case itself. Now on this motherboard, they actually connect on the bottom middle-ish on the right there next to the front panel connector. Very unusual, usually it's next to the 24-pin power connector on the motherboard. We then have two USB ports, and this is for internal things like fan power controllers and also the pump head. So the display from the crack and cooler, for example, needs to be connected up to this. So we've got two connections that we're gonna to have to do there. So plug in all those cables now, and then you can position the tray into the case. I will also note that it is worth considering your power cables for your graphics card in this as well. And I'll show you why in a second, but you can see that there's not much room down the bottom there, especially with the fan tray in place to actually plug these cables in. Much easier to take the motherboard tray out than it is to try and get tiny fingers down there. 
So power connections, two 8-pin CPU power connections with the top left of the motherboard running from the power supply. I'm using Corsair's premium sleeve cables for this, a nice black and white to help with the contrast of the build that I've got going on with the black motherboard and the white case. I thought it'd be a nice addition there. And then running those cables in, plugging those in there. And you can see maybe that in the low position, it lets a lot of cable be visible, which is one downside. Then the 24 pin power cable from the power supply to the right hand side of the motherboard. You can see the way those cable tidying hooks work. You can adjust those and they use the same sort of attachments as the SSDs. So you can easily reposition those to manage your cables and then run the 24 pin power cable through to the front and plug it in on the right hand side. I'm quickly showing you this outside the case so it's more visible where that plugs in and then clips in. Make sure you push it until it clicks into place and then run those cables and tidy those up as well. Then the USB-C connector and this is for the front panel. Again, that plugs in just below there and it'll only go in one way and make sure it makes a clicking sound when you plug it in so that you can ensure that that's definitely connected. Then we have the data cables for the SSDs and hard disk drives. Bottom right of the motherboard, those plug in and then run through to the rear. And you can see we've got a lot of access to holes to be able to hide those away and run them through to the rear. And then plugging those into the SSDs that we mounted earlier on. So in this case, that crucial drive that's plugged in there. And then I mounted another one in the cage as well. So make sure you plug those in. And we'll also need the power cables for those to make sure that they'll spin up and run. And so then we have this SATA power cable, which is obviously daisy chainable. So you can connect multiple things up to it. Although I will not, I ended up using two of these, one for the fan controller that you'll see in a minute, and then one for the SSDs so that they were separated out. Cause sometimes if you put too many devices on one of these cables, then not everything will work properly, but you can then readjust your clips so that you can reposition them and tidy those cables up and then plug in both drives with that single cable and it's kind of neat ish not not amazing but pretty good and you have the flexibility to be able to move that around and position it as you want to try and tidy up as we go which is nice and certainly an advantage over the traditional plastic ties but you can see how this works not only is it quite a deep metal hook but also has velcro ties on it too so you can tie things down that way now this is the lee and lee al120 v2 fan controller so as i said the sync cable from the fans goes up to the sync port so that's for the rgb lighting from the fans connected to the radiator then have the flat connector for the other fans that were installed on the case, which gives you both fan power and RGB lighting in one connection. And we're running that to the two ports on the controller as well. So now six of the fans, fan speed and RGB is being controlled by the controller. And then two on the radiator with the RGB lighting is being controlled by this same system. So with L Connect, you can then control all the lighting from this one controller done a separate wiring guide on these fans and i'll link to that in the description but this setup is fairly straightforward as you can see then you just need to make sure you connect both the sata power cables from this controller and the other things like the usb cable that runs from it to the bottom of the motherboard to plug that in so that it will actually be seen in l connect otherwise you won't be able to control the fans so that's important to do that and i run that down there and plug that in as i've shown already and then we need to make sure that the pump is connected as well. So there's a single breakout cable that plugs into the pump. And you can see now this is one of the other things to think about is where those cables are going to run from. So when you are installing it with the tubes, obviously it can only come out of one part. We need to make sure we plug in the small cable from that to the pump fan connection on there or AIO pump on the motherboard and if you do that it might cause problems with your bios complaining about cpu fan not being detected so a simple solution there is just to connect it up to cpu fan or to adjust the settings in the bios we then run those cables to the rear one of which is another usb cable which we need to connect at the bottom of the motherboard as i said already and then the other one is a sata power connection and a fan power connection the fan power one's really handy because it means that you can do this where you plug the single fan power cable from those two 
me and the AL120 V2 fans into the pump. So that then means that the pump and the fans are all controlled by the one system. As long as you connect up the SATA power and USB connections, that should then work really nicely. So just plugging that into those cables that use the same ones as the SSDs. And then you just run that USB connection down to the bottom as well and plug that in too. You can see we've got a lot more cables going on here, but it's nicely tidied up in a way and there's still plenty of space down there as well with the additional SATA power cables we can make sure that the power is separated out for the fan controller and for the pump versus the SSD I just found this worked a bit nicer so if you do have two cables I would recommend using them because it seems to be more efficient than trying to connect everything to one cable this will vary from system to system. The other thing to note is up the top here, we do have some Velcro ties to tidy the cables up. You'll have seen that the eight pin power cables to the motherboard look a little bit messy early on in this build and still aren't perfect by the end of it, to be honest, but that's because they run so high up from here. Now the SSD tray, you'll note when I tried to close it initially, it wouldn't shut. And that's because where I'd taken out earlier, it actually lifted up a little bit on the pins in it so you don't actually need to sort of push it back down but it is held in place with the magnet so once you do it just clips in there and then it's done and you can see loads of cables now hidden away back there then there's the power cable for the graphics card i mentioned earlier on so this is the strimmer from lee and lee which gives you the rgb lighting again i found that i had to move the motherboard tray out in order to access the bottom of the case to then be able to thread this cable through you might want to do the same if you're using a standard power cable for your graphics card but it's very tight down there and getting a chunkier cable through is a little bit fiddly so i had to take it out to thread it through and then plug it in on the other side this cable is interesting because it has a 5 volt rgb connection on it but you can then use a special connector which then connects that to a little sync cable which will then sync into the al120 v2 fan so you can then control the rgb lighting from there as well so that strimmer is rather than controlled by its own separate control box which you can get separately now syncs up with the rgb of the al120 v2 fans this strimmer then uses two pca power connections so the traditional six plus two connector connects up to the two that are then running through it works as an extension lead so you need to plug in the standard power cables that you've got for your graphics card into your power supply unit pinch those together on the other end and then plug them both in to there ensuring that they're seated fully all the way in they're a little bit fiddly to do but there is a clip on there push that in until it clicks into place and both are secured nicely and then obviously we we'll plug in the streamer into the graphics card which in this case is a zotac 3060 that i purchased because it's a little nice white graphics card that should work well with this build and is relatively affordable and hopefully will give some good gaming performance. Now, this is obviously an older generation, but still a decent card for the money. And I really like it, to be honest. Well, you can see here it is fairly tiny. So one of the things you don't need to use is the anti-sag bracket that's included. But I do want to note that there is an anti-sag bracket included with the case, which you can install on the motherboard. And that's really easy to do because it replaces a couple of the standoffs on the right hand side and secures into place. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to demo it here, but it is included with the case as standard. So just note that then you can just basically seat your GPU in. But you can see this is so tiny. We don't need an anti-sag bracket for this one. It's just going to slide in into place at the top brackets and you see there is plenty of space where the tubes are on the all-in-one cooler as well so despite what it looked like not much room it is actually fine so just securing that with the thumb screws that we took out a second ago and then plugging those cables in a little bit difficult to do because they are fiddly and especially on this gpu where for some reason the power connectors are seated further in it was a bit of a faff to get these in but once that's done, it looks a bit neater at the front, I think, with these cables. And obviously, you have that nice RGB lighting from it as well. Now, one of the things I did notice was when I installed this somehow, the cables were off to the left a little bit. You can adjust it by taking the motherboard tray back out and then maneuvering those cables. But again, it was a little bit fiddly. So now I've got a lot more cables going on here. And... I realized I could use some of the Velcro ties to adjust things. But one of the nice things about this, you will see just how spacious it is back here because it's easy to be able to shut that door and hide those cables away and then to put the back door back on 
easily without any problems. So there's no issues with bulging. Got quite a few devices in there now as well. And still it's not been a problem in terms of setting up. And then we can just replace all the panels, putting the glass back on and finishing it up. Pretty pleased with how this has come out. I will note that the power cables are a little bit messy. I think I'm not 100% happy with those. I could maybe use some plastic cable ties to tidy those up. But this is the problem with having it in that low mode. You can see just how much cable is exposed in this position. It's one downside to the case, unfortunately. If you want to mount a 240mm radiator at the rear, you need to put the motherboard in the low position. And then you've got loads of cables running out the top. So that kind of looks a little bit messy, but... It really depends what you're going to be doing with it, I think, and personal preference. Still happy with the end result. It actually runs quite cool in this case with this i5 CPU. I think with an i9, you might struggle to keep it as cool, but we do have six intake fans, so there's good airflow onto the GPU and into the system in general. You just don't have as much air escaping in other places because obviously we've got a glass panel on top. But in terms of being able to see what's going on inside there, this is a great looking case and the finished product looks really nice. And hopefully I've given you some good insights into this case and what to do with it and what's possible. If you've enjoyed this video and you've made it this far, consider subscribing if you haven't already and drop me a comment down below on what you think. And if you're going to get the case, what are you going to do with it? you think maybe an air tower will be better or are you going to do 360 mil radiator let me know i'd like to hear your thoughts i'd like to revisit this maybe and see what we can do with it but another great case from lee and lee in terms of the design and the overall build quality of it great feeling great looking and really nicely put together in a number of ways just not as flexible as some of the other lee and lee cases i've seen in terms of what you can do but you can see that you can visibly see the rgb lighting on the other side as well so where the rear venting panels are there's plenty of visibility there but here you can see it alongside the dynamic evo xl which is a larger case and that has a lot more rgb but otherwise a great build thanks very much for watching have a great time You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.